So yeah, I'm glad that I was um, strategically scheduled after Cole because um, this is going to be extending upon what you've learned in the previous talk about meta tracing. So I'm going to try and speak for about an hour. Um, we can do what we did with the other talks. You can you can butt in at any point and, and ask a question. And I'll I'll try my best to answer. Then this is collaborative work with all of the people you see on the slide here. Okay. So as a starting point, we will start talking about language composition. This is what this is all about: language composition. So we'll start with a very informal um, definition of that. So we could say it's the ability to write a computer program in a mix of programming languages. So whereas traditionally we might choose one programming language and stick with it, language composition is about removing that restraint and possibly writing programs in a mix of different programming languages. So a natural next question is, why might you like to do that? Well, there are a number of reasons. So firstly, it's not hard to imagine a program where it's made of lots of different sub-modules, if you like, and each module is, um, is for a different concern, and that concern may be expressed best in one language, whereas another sub-module might be expressed best in another language. So for example, you might have a user interface that you might want to write in Java, for example, and we might have some statistical analysis, um, which um, the result of is going to be shown in the Java GUI, so perhaps we would use, like to use R for that part. So using language composition, this should be possible. Um, secondly, and kind of trivially, if you, if you have access to more languages in your program, you have, you have access, to, uh, access to a broader set of libraries um, almost for free, right? So you might be working in one language, but you really like the library that does, um, say, graphing from another language. So you should be able to use that library um, from the other language. And thirdly, and maybe most significantly, um, for language migration. Now, what I mean by this is, let me give an example. Suppose we have a very large code base written in an old crusty language which not many people know anymore. Um, use your imagination. So suppose that we want to migrate this to something which is um, modern, which, is, um, which people um, know, and which um, is easily maintainable. Well, using language composition, what you could do is you could start moving parts of your old, um, your old code base into an, um, the more modern language incrementally. So you wouldn't have to do a clean room rewrite. It's not like you have to start rewriting your entire code base from scratch. You can start moving parts across, and in theory, the, the project should remain executable the whole time while you're doing this. And of course, at some stage, you'll have, you have converted the entire program to the second programming language, in which case you succeeded. We haven't actually done this. This is in theory, of course. <laughs> okay. Okay, so people in the audience are probably thinking, ah, yeah, well, we already have um, language composition in the form of the foreign function interface. That's true. Now, this is a form of language composition for sure because we have one language calling another. But I'm going to try and um, I'm going to try and put you off this idea. Um, I'm going to first argue that um, this is a very coarse form of language composition, and also it's a, um, it's it's very limited in its in its scope for languages. So your typical foreign function interface architecture looks like this. You have code for one language in one file, code for another language in another file, and then you can do function calls across the boundary. So you can pass arguments when doing so, and the return value comes back. And there is some kind of type of conversion that happens over the boundary. <coughs> so that's great, and it, it does give us the ability to call between these two languages. It's language composition. So like I said, it's coarse. The reason I, that I think this is coarse is because the two different source codes are in separate files, separate compilation units. Secondly, we have a very limited choice of languages usually when we, have, when we use a foreign function interface. Um, often it's the case that we have to call down to the implementation language of language A or to the system's ABI, and this really limits the scope of what languages we can use in language composition. So the goal of this work really is to try and do better. The first thing we, we would like to be able to do is to actually take the two, two um, different uh, languages and bring them into the same file. So that's what this diagram is showing here. Once we've done that, then we open the door to some other more interesting things that we could try. For example, could we mix our methods and functions and expressions in a more fine-grained manner? Can we integrate the scoping of the two languages? Um, can we use arbitrary, language, arbitrary languages, not just a high-level language and its implementation language, or a high-level language and the system ABI? And you can dream up lots of other things that you, you could also try 
um, once you once you've migrated this model. And what would you class core by as? Is that like part of the I don't know much about core, but if I'm honest. <laughs> I'm too young for it, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't allow all these things, of course. Okay. Um, let's talk afterwards, because you have to explain the core first. Okay. Right, so that's 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 basically the goal of all of this work. We want to try and mix the languages in, in more um, intuitive and, and intelligent ways. Um, so that really motivates the work. Now let's talk about how we might how we might approach um, the problem should we wish to implement such a system. So what this boils down to really is composing two languages which we'll call X and Y to give another language which we'll call Z. And of course Z is going to be a superset of both X and Y in some sense. Um, now that's very abstract and it looks very simple when you draw a diagram like this but we have to look closer to really understand what we're trying to achieve here. If you look closely you'll see that each of these languages have a syntax and a runtime, the runtime being the VM, of course. Um, now, we have to, in some sense, compose those two things independently in order to achieve the overarching goal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on each of these aspects and talk about how we might attempt to compose these components. First, let's talk about syntax. So we all know from Compilers 101 that the... Um, the text which a programming language will accept is described by its grammar, and its grammar is usually a declarative um, description of this. In, um, it's defined by tokens, etc. I expect you all know that. So what we want to achieve here is we want to compose a grammar X and a grammar Y to arrive at a grammar Z. Now, how would, we, how would we start doing that? Well, perhaps what we would do is we would start making the rules in, in the grammar X refer to the rules in the grammar Y and vice versa. And in some sense, there are these arms reaching across the, um, across the grammars, right? And it's, again, draw a pretty diagram. Sounds very simple when you, when you put it this way. However, there are lots of technical challenges. In short, it's due to the problems with existing um, parsing technology. So we have lots of different ways of parsing. Um, we've tried composing all of um, we've tried all of these different approaches to compose grammars, and they all fail in some sense. For example, if you use an LR grammar, then you can end up with an undefined grammar. If you use a PEG parser, then you can you can shadow your rules without realizing. If you use a GLR uh, grammar, then you can end up with ambiguity, which means that there is more than one way to parse the input text, and you can't really ask the user which of these parse trees did you mean because the user probably doesn't actually know. They don't work on that level. All right, so let's think out the box before. Let's have a look at syntax-directed editing. Anyone familiar with this, by the way? Okay, a few hands. Good, good, good. So the idea behind syntax-directed editing is that you are no longer editing a text file. You are editing the AST of the program directly. So by doing this, you sidestep the parsing step, in a sense. Um, so the, what, what, this is a, a screenshot from, um, a, from a syntax-directed editor. And you see that there are placeholder boxes where the user is able to click and they're able to then type in um, some part of their program. And by typing parts of their program, they might trigger new boxes to appear. And they can click in those and they can, they can start building a program in this way. Now, this may be useful for us because we can, we can use those boxes to disambiguate the grammars, right? So we can have a box for um, one language and a box for another language. And then there's no ambiguity shadowing any of that because the user is going to give us a, um, an AST which, is, um, which is precisely describes the program without having to do any parsing, right? So wonderful, that should work. And I'm sure it would. However, the problem with this form of editing is that it's, it really removes you from the, um, the freeform text editing experience that you and I are really used to. So we all have our favorite text editor or IDE and we are very used to um, typing in syntactically incorrect programs at first in the interim before um, and we hack and we, um, we delete large chunks of checks between um, in the middle of classes and things. All of those kinds of things are um, very different when you edit in this way because you cannot type in anything which is not a valid AST. Um, so it really gets in the way. Has anyone tried SDE? <laughs> Would you agree with that? Yeah, good. 
Okay, so we will, we kind of dismiss this. We, it's, a, it's a nice thought, but no, it doesn't work for us. Moving on to composing runtimes now. So again, you draw a pretty diagram and it looks very simple. You want to take some runtime X, some time runtime Y, do some composition step and end up with a runtime which can execute both X and Y. And the question is, is that easy? So if I tasked people with doing this, I imagine that the first thing that they would try would be something like this. So what we have here is we have two interpreters for two programming languages, X and Y, and we glue them together using the, interpre the, um, the implementation language of these, two language of these two interpreters. So it's most likely to be C or C++ in this case. <coughs> does that work? Yes, it does work. What's the problem? The problem is that interpreters are slow. Um, preaching to the choir here. So if you take two things which are slow, you compose them together, you don't get something which is fast. It's kind of obvious, right? So you have to do something more intricate. What would the natural next step be? Well, we can add JIT compilers. As we know, just-in-time compilers do, um, give us um, performance increases, they give us specula um, speculation, um, all of these wonderful optimizations. So it seems natural to take two VMs which already have a just-in-time compiler and then glue them together again in the same way using their implementation language, which may be C or C++ for example. I'm sure that this works too. However, this is a ton of engineering. So you remember from Mario's talk, he had a, he had a graph where um, it was um, speed versus effort. And all of the fast VMs are right over the right hand side of the effort scale. And that's because writing these just in time compiler components is a no small undertaking. Um, you can pump years and years into making these things work well. Um, so. Supposing that you want to glue together two languages, if you're lucky, you'll find two, um, two languages which both have a just-in-time compiler and which are written in the, sa the same language, so you can glue them together. If you're unlucky, then the language is immature and it doesn't already have a just-in-time compiler, and you may have to write one or, if you're really unlucky, two of these just-in-time compilers. So that's not a great approach either. All right, so let's try and be a bit sneaky. Can we do something like this? Can we? can we t target the interpreters to an existing VM which already has a just-in-time compiler? And the idea being that we don't have to write a just-in-time compiler and we should get good performance and everyone is happy. Um, nice idea doesn't always work. So we coin this informally the semantic mismatch. Don't read into the wording too much. What this refers to is the fact that most of these VMs are built with a, a set of um, programming languages in mind which they are going to be very good at optimizing. Um, if you put languages which fall outside of that class, then the performance, you don't really get the performance increase that you would hope for. It's, they can be quite underwhelming. So um, things like Jython don't really exceed um, the performance of CPython a great deal, for example. So we have to think outside the box again. So to summarize, we still need a way of composing our grammars, and we still need a way of composing our runtimes. And our approach is to use two new methods, one called language boxes, one called meta tracing. I know that we, I've just, we've just seen a talk about meta tracing, so you, um, you're all experts at this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, for the, for the purpose of the video, I will go over the meta tracing background, but I'm going, to go, I'm going to gloss over it very quickly. I won't go into as much detail as Carl Friedrich did. So starting with language boxes. The idea behind language boxes is that we borrow the best ideas from syntax-structured editing, but we try and claw back the editing experience that you and I are all very used to. And the, the um, outcome should be that we have a very simple and practical way to compose our grammars. How does this work? So I'm going to do this on slides. Later on, you'll see me using an editor which is aware of language boxes, and you'll see me actually editing code live. Suppose that we are going to use a, um, a, co a combination of Java and SQL, and we want to iterate over a result, a result set from a database. So we're going to be mixing Java and SQL code to do this. So in my special editor, I would start typing in freeform text, for string, colon, and there's nothing special about that. At this point, I'm going to be saying what I want to iterate over. Um, and I perhaps want to, this one needs to be the result of uh, an SQL query. 
So what I would do is I'd use a special key combination to open this SQL language box. Once the language box is open, I'm then free to type my SQL code into the language box, again, in free form. So there's no clicking in boxes and things. I mean, this is very, very easy to switch between the boxes. And if I like, I can even nest these language boxes. So here we see that the right-hand side of the where, um, the where um, statement there has been, um, has been populated by Java code. And we can nest these things arbitrarily deeply, should we wish. The takeaway from this slide is, firstly, this isn't a great deal of effort for the user. All they have to do is remember key combinations to come in, open new language boxes, come and come out of language boxes. Secondly, all of these boxes can be parsed independently, which means that you sidestep all of the problems that I described earlier with the parsing um, technology. Um, so all we have to do is say where a box is valid. So for example, the, Python gra uh, the Java grammar knows that an SQL language box is valid here, but it doesn't look inside it, it doesn't care, it just wants to know that there is a box there. Moving now to the composing the runtimes. So I mentioned that we use meta tracing. Uh, you've seen meta tracing from the last talk, yes. So it's a, it's a way of um, building high performance VMs um, with little effort, effectively. So you write an interpreter, you pass it through a meta tracing translator, what comes out the other side is a VM containing not only your interpreter, but a tracing JIT. And this is highly practical because you don't have to write the tracing just in time compiler. As you saw in Carl's talk, you may have to um, add a couple of annotations and give some hints, but you certainly don't have to write all of the boilerplate and the, the tricky stuff which takes years. So dig, digging a little deeper, again, I'm mostly, I'm mostly um, duplicating what Carl says but I'll, I'll go over it quickly. So what, what you have to do is you, you basically tell the meta tracer where your loops are. So if you're an AST interpreter, then the, your nodes themselves will be loops and you'll have to tell the meta tracer about those. If you're a bytecode interpreter, then you'll, you'll mark the, um, the main dispatch loop. That's enough information for the, for the meta tracing tool chain to build the tracing just in time compiler for you. And the, the main, um, the main thing to know about meta tracing is that you're tracing the interpreter implementation itself, not the user's program. So you're not tracing bytecodes, for example. You are tracing implementations of bytecodes. <laughs> it's, it's the same example from Carl's, um, from Carl's talk. So suppose you have a bytecode interpreter. Um, maybe it looks like this. You've got your dispatch loop, which is the, the infinite loop. Each iteration of the loop is just going to say, load the next bytecode and then decide what to do with it. So we have here, say, pop and branch. There is a program counter variable, which is the virtual program counter of the virtual machine. To add meta tracing to such an interpreter, you have to add first this JIT merge point hint. And what the JIT merge point does is it does two things. First, it says, um, here is a loop. Um, please trace, start, um, start collecting traces here once you've deemed them hot. Secondly, um, it Tell it, it, we, are, we are able to pass what characterizes the traces. And in this case, we're passing the program counter. So what this means is that when we collect traces, they are specific to the virtual program counter. And these, the, the program counter furthermore will be constant within those traces. Any questions thus far? Good. So suppose that this is your entire dispatch loop and you've got a small slip, snippet here of, um, of user program. Suppose this is called in a loop somewhere, so eventually it gets hot, and the meta tracer will then start collecting a trace through the implementation of the bytecodes. So this corresponds to a, tra um, a path through, well, many iterations of that loop, effectively. At some point, the trace is, um, is we finish collecting the trace, the trace optimizer jumps in, crushes it down into hopefully some very nice optimized um, JIT codes, and then eventually that is what gets compiled to native code and then used in future iterations of that particular program counter value. And of course there are guards in there to make sure that we don't deviate from the behavior that we saw when we were collecting the trace. Okay. Right, unwinding. What on earth does this have to do with VM composition? Our idea is, is, is as follows. 
If we take two interpreters which are written in a metatracing language and we glue them together again using the metatracing language, so that's what this glue layer is showing here, we pass this through the metatracing tool chain. What drops out the other side is a composed VM containing a composed interpreter and a composed tracing just in time compiler. So this is very practical again because we didn't have to write one JIT, we didn't have to write two JITs. We wrote two interpreters and we glued them together. The idea behind this is that we get good performance and we don't expend a great deal of time engineering. In our approaches, we're using RPython. So everything that you see in the red circle there is written in RPython. So the interpreters are written in, in um, statically typed subset of Python with hints and the same for our glue. Our glue is just method calls between those two source bases. And the missing piece is how we glue those two things together. So the user edits their program in a special editor. We have one called Eco, which I'll show you shortly. Then when the user clicks the run button in the editor, this is flattened out into an intermediate representation. The intermediate representation in RVMs is always the um, the outermost language. So in this case, um, suppose this is the, um, um, PHP and Python, then this is a PHP program with all the inner boxes encoded into strings. The strings have all, be, have all been syntax checked by the editor, of course, so there's no um, scope for syntax errors at that point. And then that intermediate representation is passed on to the Compose VM where it's executed. So to summarize our approach, we edit um, our programs using language boxes. This means we don't have any problems with composing grammars, and we retain the nice um, text editing feel that you and I are all very used to. We use meta tracing to compose the VMs. This is little engineering effort and gives us some, um, some good performance. And we glue this all together using an intermediate representation. Right. Pause for questions. On the first call, and so you know in that case it will exist, or by my case, it you know that it will exist. It will exit that Python interpreter pretty quickly. And then yeah. Go back to the answer. Well, you don't know that it will exit completely quickly. I mean, it could never return, but it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> All right. So that's the that's the motivation and um, and our approach. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some of the compositions which we've implemented using the approach I've just outlined. Um, we have implemented three such compositions. The first is a composition of Python and Prolog. The second is a composition of PHP and Python. And the third is a composition of Python and SQLite. I'm going to talk about the first two because these are the ones that I've worked most directly with. I'm going to use the first one, Unification, as a stepping stone to PyHype because um, PyHype is really this is, this is the best example that we have of a fine-grained language composition. Right, so jumping in. This is the architecture of, of the Python and Prolog interpreter. So we have PyPy on the left-hand side, which um, Carl also introduced in the last talk. So it's a very uh, mature and fast Python VM using our Python. He also introduced Prolog, actually. This is the Prolog interpreter, and this is... Um, it works very well, it's, but it's not as well optimized and it's not as mature as PyPy. So we expect it to execute code a little bit slower. And what we had to do was implement some cross-language interfacing code, which again is written in R Python. So the idea behind this first VM was to prove that this concept could work. Can we take two VMs, put them in the same address space, have them execute different, um, different languages, um, and it also it got us thinking about how we need to expose this functionality to the user because all, you, you of course need some kind of interface that allows the user to invoke the other language and this needs to be intuitive so if it's not intuitive the users aren't going to be able to use it. So to give you an idea of what such an interface looks like here is a composed program of P Python and Prolog. <coughs> 
So we had a prologue talk as well, so we are all experts in prologue as well. So the first thing to know is that we always start in Python world in, in um, th this particular type of composed program. The first line is showing um, an import where we import the functionality to access the prologue interpreter. Then these lines here uh, are showing, we, we instantiate a prologue engine and we pass to its constructor what's called a prologue database. So this is the, um, the list of facts and predicates which um, constitute the rules of, of the, um, the prologue program. What we're doing here is actually building a graph using tr trivial facts. So these, these are, this edge predicate is saying there is an edge from node A to C, there is an edge from node C to B, etc. And there's a, so it's building a graph. What this path predicate is doing is it's allowing us to say, how can I get from this node to this node in at most 10 jumps, for example? And this variable here will be unified with um, possible solutions. And of course, there may be many. Prolog has this backtracking feature, which means that there are more than one way to achieve a solution. So after we've insta instantiated the Prolog engine, we then have this line here, which is basically saying, I'm interested in calling the path predicate, so this predicate here, and I'm expecting to see multiple solutions, so please give me an iterator. And we assign this to this paths variable. And then on this line, what we're doing is we're iterating over the, the results from the prologue, um, the invocation to the prologue engine, and we are obtaining um, a tuple of two, um, two values, and we're printing them. So this here is actually doing a call to the iterator. We're passing all of these arguments here, and these are the arguments which are going to be passed to this prologue predicate here. So this string B gets converted to a prologue atom B. This number four gets converted to a prologue number four. The nums are special. These are saying, these are unbound variables. Prologue has the notion of unbound variables, and the, the act of unifying them is actually what constitutes a solution. So because we have two nums here, two variables, results will be tuples with two elements. And then we print them out. So that gives you an idea of um, an early, um, our early interface to um, a second language. Prolog can actually call back to Python as well using a special name, uh, namespace, but it can only call functions in this particular VM. So this VM really proved that this can work. We, um, we can execute two languages um, side by side in the same address space. We didn't expend a great deal of effort doing this. It probably was a few months at most. And it gave pretty good performance. And this, is, this was largely due to the fact that we had cross-language tracing. And what I mean by that is that the tracer would collect a trace starting in, in um, Python. It would cross over the language boundary, the trace, into Prolog, where it would then perhaps return again back to Python. And this would all be a straight line trace between the two languages. Talking of performance, we need to go on a slight detour and talk about how we benchmark to these things. The problem, of course, is that we're talking about benchmarking composed programs. There are no composed programs in the wild of Python and Prolog. So there are no composed benchmarks of Python and Prolog. So we have to, in some sense, make our own benchmarks somehow. How do we do this? What we did was we started with two what we call mono-language benchmarks, which are benchmarks written in one language. So for our PyHype uh, interpreter, this would be a uh, Python implementation of a benchmark, and this would be a Prolog implementation of a benchmark. Then what you can do is you can derive two further variants by swapping functions for the other language. So in the case of um, variant three, we started with a Python program, and then we swapped some of the uh, methods for Prolog predicates. And we can do the same, you can make a, another variant, of course, by swapping them in the opposite order. Then what we do is we do a performance comparison between these two and these two. They should be somewhere close. Um, of course, we expect some, perhaps some slowdown because of type conversion between the boundaries. But in general, the JIT is very good at removing the, um, removing the type conversion even. So there are some numbers for the, that first composition of Python and Prolog. The way to read this is, um, this is the ratio of a Python to Prolog benchmark 
relative to just a pure Python benchmark. Similarly for this, this is a, py a Python to pro um, Prolog benchmark relative to Prolog. Okay, and they're all normalized to this last column here, which is um, the composed VM relative to itself. We, have, we didn't use all of the variants that I showed in the last, in the last slide. We only used variant um, three, I think. That's why there are not more columns in the, in the table. But anyway, if you, if you skim down your eyes down the columns, you'll see that performance is, generally speaking, very encouraging. There is, um, this is the slowest case, and it really is uh, a bit of an outlier. In general, we're between, uh, let's see, 0.2x and about 6x. Really depends what the workload is for the VM. So although it's a mixed bag, I, I'd say that this is very encouraging. And it was, it was very encouraging to us back then when we were implementing this, that this has potential to be fast, which is it's really good. So what were the limitations of this VM? Firstly, it did very little in terms of syntactic integration. So you remember earlier on I said that one of our goals was to try and mix the languages in a very fine-grained manner. Well, if you look at the, um, if you look at such a program in our editor, I have an example actually. Right. I apologize for not fitting much on the screen. I needed to use a large font. So this is a Python and Prolog program. So you, typically with these programs, what you'd have is you'd have a ton of Python code, which is the white code here, and then you'd just have a big Prolog database in the middle. And all the editor is really doing when you edit such a program is it's just syntax checking the two languages and sticking some triple quotes around the Prolog engine. So that's really, we're not, we're not using this to its full potential. Secondly, the type conversions were very um, rudimentary. You could pass Python instances to Prolog predicates, but once they're there, it's just a black box which can be passed around. The Prolog interpreter can't see into the instance, it can't do attribute lookups, it can't do method calls. Um, so it wasn't very transparent, in other words. And we felt that we could do better. Actually, I'm gonna go back to that example and just show you this quickly. This, so this demonstrates the kind of thing that we were able to write um, using this VM. It's a fairly large program and it's a game of Connect4. The user interface is written in Python using the TK toolkit and all of the game logic is implemented using this Minimax solver here which we, for the most part, lifted from a prologue book. All we had to do was um, give a, li a little bit of domain specific knowledge about the game of Connect4. And when I run this, well, it's a game of Connect Four. So it's two AIs playing against each other. Um, all of the game logic, like I say, is implemented in Prolog. The user interface is all written in Python. It doesn't. Um, the user interface is not concerned with any of the of the game state, really. Okay, moving back to slides. Any questions at this point? Good. Yeah, quick question. Yes. Sorry. If you have to make assumptions about um, a common object model between the two languages. Right. There's two different approaches here, aren't there? The first is that you try and unify, so you have two trees <coughs> of, type of type systems, effectively. The first approach is that you could try and make them so they all have a common ancestor, right? So you, in a sense, you merge the two type systems. This was not the approach we took because we thought that it would be too, in, um, too difficult. What we, there's a mapping, in, in, so the two type systems remain <coughs> separated, yeah. and there is an automatic type conversion layer, which um, says, you know, oh, it's an integer, so I need to convert this to a to a integer for the other language. And similarly, when it returns, the the reverse is done. I'll talk more about the type conversion layer later on. <coughs> okay, so that was our first composition, and we've it's very promising, um, but it has some limitations. This brings us to our second composition, which we call PyHype. It's a composition of PHP and Python. Now, again, we use PyPy, um, and we also use HippieVM, which is um, a, another fairly, um, a fairly young um, interpreter for PHP, written in R Python. Then we, again, we glue it together using some cross-language interfacing code. And the goal of this 
this composition was to push this as far as we can. Can we do the syntactic interoperability stuff that we were talking about earlier? Um, can we do far less opaque type conversions? And probably most importantly, can we get this down to um, within 2x, ideally, of, um, of model language programs? And the answer is yes. So these are all the things that the VM supports. You can call Python functions and methods from PHP and in the other direction, so that's not particularly groundbreaking. There are really transparent type conversions. So when I pass an instance from one language to the, to the next, the, um, the receiving language can see inside the, the attributes that can do method calls, etc. <coughs> we can arbitrarily nest off our own functions. This allows us to do things like closures between the two languages. We can have Python expressions in PHP. We can embed Python methods inside PHP classes. Um, for reasons I'll show later, we had to add support for references to Python. Um, we have cross-language scoping, and we have cross-language exceptions. So we really tried to go all out as far as we could um, with, with the tools that we had. Right, at this point I'm going to give a demo of some of those features. This is going to be a live coding demo, so disclaimer, these things usually go wrong. <laughs> so this is our composed language editor. It's called Eco, it's a prototype written in Python. Let's pull that across there. So we have the editing pane, we have the console down here, which is going to show the output of the programs, and we have here the parsing status, and I'll show you why, why that's important later. So in PyHype, all programs begin as PHP programs. So I, any PHP program I can muster should be able to execute here, and it can. So we see the result here below. So that's not hugely interesting. Let's do some language composition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press Control l and this drops down a list of all of the the languages which the editor is aware of. <clears throat> so we have grammar definitions for all of these languages. The ones which are bold at the top are the ones which are syntactically valid at the current cursor position. So I could either insert a Python and PHP box or a Python expression at this point. <clears throat> what I'll do is insert a Python and PHP box and start typing some Python code. All right, so we'll have a, a function which accepts an X and perhaps it returns X plus one making this up as I go. I used another key combination there, control shift L to drop back outside of the language box and I go one step up to the parent box. And what I can do then is I can call this function with say the number of the beast and execute it and we see the correct result printed below. <coughs> now this raises lots of questions already. How on earth does this work? So let's take this apart. First, um, when, we, when the VM executes this, it will see this language box and it will invoke the Python bytecode interpreter to get some bytecode. The, py the bytecode is then cached, so that if we, um, if we encounter the box again, it's not compiled a second time. Then it starts interpreting at the global level, where it sees that it needs to call um, f of 666. Now, when this was compiled, it was, it was uh, adapted in such a way that it appears to PHP as a native function. So PHP doesn't know any better about this. It thinks that this um, Python function is in fact a normal PHP function, and it doesn't care. So it invokes the function, and it passes the argument 666. This value is intercepted by the glue layer, which I was showing in the, uh, in the diagram. So what happens here is the, the, uh, the PHP number 666 is converted to a Python integer 666 and it's bound to the local variable x. For the rest of the Python frame, Python just carries on doing its thing. It doesn't know that there's a language composition involved. When it comes to return the value, the result has to be converted back to something that PHP understands. So the value um, 667 in this case is converted from a Python integer back to a PHP integer and then PHP simply echoes it. Let's do something more interesting. Let's put a variable here, um, value two, for example, and instead of adding one, I'll add y. So this shows the correct answer, 668. And the way that this works is that the we have um, special scope lookups. So we change the way that the scope lookups work between the two languages. So when the Python um, interpreter sees that y is not in the current scope, instead of raising a name error, it first 
traverses the um, it traverses up the call stack into the other language and sees, aha, well there's that Y variable I was looking for. It converts it into something that Python understands and then everything continues as normal. Another example. Let's do something a little bit more intricate. Suppose I find a class in here and um, we'll give it a constructor. Live coding makes me nervous. <sighs> give this the value seven, shall we? Uh huh. Doesn't need that anymore. Right, let's assign this to. The PHP grammar is actually very um, finicky about what you can and can't do, do, so I have to assign this first to something. What's happened here is that on the fly inside the Python box, we've defined a new class, we've instantiated it, and we've returned it back to, Py uh, to PHP. What happens there is a type conversion has to happen, as we've already explored. But this is kind of a non-trivial type uh, type conversion. There's not an, it's not like it's just a primitive integer. It's now a user type, and it's a type that we didn't know about before we started running the program. So what happens here is that the instance falls through the type conversion layer. And what the type conversion layer does is it adapts it. And by adapt, I mean an adapter is uh, allocated and it's put around the um, Python object. And what the adapter is doing is it's offering to PHP the illusion that this is a, a native instance. So again, PHP doesn't know that this is, this is foreign data. When you do method lookups or um, attribute lookups, the operation is forwarded to the underlying object and we ask the Python interpreter to do this for us and then the result is converted back to, the, um, to PHP in this case. Like I said, we can nest these things. So here this shows that we can embed um, Python in PHP and then PHP in Python. So what we do here is we make, a, we make a function and we return the function and then the function is callable in the outermost scope. So a note on parsing statuses. I can make this innermost box syntactically incorrect. And you notice that only the innermost box is upset now. This is showing that all of the boxes are in fact being parsed independently. Um, so, like I say, the, the P Python grammar does not care that there is a syntax error in that innermost box. It just knows that the innermost box is in the correct position. This example shows that we can do cross-language exceptions. So what I do is I call between Python and PHP a few times, and then in the lower, in the um, innermost stack frame, I divide by zero, and the exception ripples up the call stack between the two languages, and um, we can then catch the foreign exception at the global level, and we can print the backtrace and the message. Oh, I'm going to make this bigger. And you notice that all the line numbers are correct too. Okay, finally, I can find the handle. This is a random number generator example that we put in one of our papers. So there is a PHP class which has the majority of the, um, it does the majority of the lifting for generating a random number with all of this bit twiddling here. It's probably not idiomatic PHP code, but it generates a random number nonetheless. Now, suppose that we want to generate a stream of random numbers. Well, a very nice facility of Python would be to use the generator, um, the generator facility. So what this method here does, this is a Python method inside the PHP class. What this does is it deals with uh, making the generator and yielding values infinitely from, um, from the random number generator. <coughs> and later on, we use a Python expression to consume values from the generator. We actually use a list comprehension here to modulo them with 62. <coughs> So we should get random numbers between 0 and 63. And if we execute that and look at the result, then we have our 25 random numbers. All right, so live coding worked. Back to slides. So a few words on performance. So we, we analyze the performance in the same kind of way. We, we compare those two, um, those four variants. So here you see, this column here is pure PHP, 
This is pure Python, and these are the two interpreters from which these interpreters are built from. The reason there's two columns here is because one is uh, with PHP on the outside, and the other is with Python on the outside. And they're all normalized to this, min this middle column here. So performance very good. Um, some surprising results in some cases. For example, here we are faster than the two interpreters from which we're built. That was a very surprising result. And the reason for this is because we think uh, a bug in the, um, in the uh, code generation in our Python, um, the mono language interpreters seem to tickle that bug, our composed interpreter doesn't seem to tickle that bug. So that was an interesting outcome. And here's some more, so the, under this line here, these are larger benchmarks, where the other ones were micro benchmarks. The slowest case that we saw was this case here. Due to the normalization, it's actually quite hard to see how much slower, but if you look at the absolute numbers, um, it's about 2.6 times slower than the mono lang than PyPy, Pi, which is a pretty good worst case, I would say. So I'm really happy with the performance of this. Good. Okay, so that's that's examples out of the way. You've seen some uh, quantitative quantitative outcomes. Now let's talk a bit about qualitative outcomes. So I'm going to talk about what we were calling semantic friction. What I mean by this is. Um, so semantic friction is basically a point where the two interpreters map very poorly. And um, in these cases, there, there's not always a, an obvious mapping between uh, the two <coughs> interpreters, and we, we have to think hard about what we want to do. On the one hand, we want to do something which the user is going to find intuitive. We want to do something that they expect. On the other hand, we may not be able to do that due to, uh, due to the way the interpreters have been implemented. So we call this semantic friction. And often, the best you can do is make a compromise. And I'll show you some cases of this now. These are all cases which we found uh, implementing PyHype. So the first thing, and I also mentioned this earlier, is that PHP has a reference system which is very similar, I'd say, to C++ for the most part. So you can, you can put ampersands on the arguments to, on a function, and this, in, this tells the interpreter at this call site, you need to pass this by reference. So what this swap function is able to do using that mechanism is to swap around the data in the two arguments, and the call site will observe the data switching around. Um, suppose that we want to replace that top function there with Python code. Well, actually we can't, because Python doesn't support any mechanism that works like this. However, we did come, we did come up with a compromise, and the compromise is we, we actually extend the Python type system with the reference type. So this is, this is how it would look using our composition. We have a special decorator called PHP Decor. This accepts a ton of different um, keywords, which you can give various hints to the VM about how to interact with, um, with PHP. The refs keyword is, um, is, allows us to say, please pass the arguments at these indices as references. So at this call site, PHP sees, aha, this is passed by reference. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to box these up into references and pass them up to this function here. So A and B are now no longer values. They're references. And we, we decided that it was best to explicitly have the user um, box, uh, unbox and, and box the value inside the reference. Um, so this, this gives us an equivalent semantics to the, the PHP function which I showed before. And if you wanted to do it the other way around and have the call site in Python, then you'd have to instantiate the boxes yourself. Um, so when we call this, um, this will only accept reference types. If you didn't box these up, this would, this would cause an exception in the glue code. So not ideal, but good enough. A second case relates to the type conversion layer. So this will answer your question. So first, a little bit of background of how the type conversion layer works. There is a language threshold as data passes across the language threshold, data is, in some sense, converted to something which the other interpreter will understand. So the two obvious cases here are ints and strings. There are really obvious mapping, an obvious one-to-one -one mapping at that between these two types. Objects I've already touched upon, they get adapted. So this PHP object, when passed to Python, gets a wrapper stuck around it and disappears to Python as a native object. Now the problem starts to arise from the uh, collection types in these two languages. PHP and Python have very different ideas about how they should do sequences and, and uh, mappings. 
So whereas Python has a, a list and a dict, and these are two distinct concerns with different types, PHP has a confusingly named type called array. It's, not, it's really not an array at all, it's actually a mapping type. So if you want a sequence in PHP, for example, you instantiate a sequence like this, it's actually a mapping, and it's a mapping from integer keys to values. So what this means is that if we have a Python list and we pass it to PHP, we can adapt it to PHP as something which appears as an array. If we have a Python dict and we pass it to PHP, we can adapt it as something which appears to PHP as an array. The only difference is that this would have integer keys and this would have mixed keys. The problem is what happens do we, when we do it in the other direction. So we have a PHP array, we pass it to Python, what should this do? It's not obvious, but what's very tempting to try is something like this. You have a PHP array with only integer keys, you pass it to Python, and Python says, ah yes, wonderful, it's got integer keys, so we can abstract this nicely um, by exposing this as a list. And if, on the other hand, we have mixed keys in the array, then we can adapt it as a dict, fine. There is a problem with this approach. The problem is that you can instantiate an array which initially has integer keys. You can pass it to Python, Python will adapt it as a list, then it could stash it away in some object state, for example. Then later on, the PHP side could mutate the array such that this array now has a string key. So what we have on, in the Python interpreter now is a list with an array with string keys, and this is pretty inconsistent. It doesn't make a great deal of sense, and I certainly don't want to burden the user with thinking about that kind of thing. So we have to do something different. What we do is we say, when a PHP array passes to Python, we always adapt it as a dictionary in the first case. If the user really is adamant about ha having this as a list, then you have an as list method on the wrapper. And this will do um, checks to make sure that this has only integer keys. And of course, um, if there are, there are various checks to make sure that this, is, this thing here is always a list. Luckily, we don't kill our performance by doing this because it's a simple type check in the RPython interpreter, and often the tracing JIT would be able to remove those type checks for us. So we were very lucky there, really. <coughs> uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the last one there. Uh, right. So let's move to conclusions. In conclusion, we can edit compose programs using language boxes, and we sidestep all of the problems that, we, um, that I described earlier to do with parsing algorithms, and we, we don't burden the user with um, an unfamiliar editing experience. Metatracing allows us to compose our VMs with relatively little effort and gives us pretty good performance. Implementing cross-language behaviors is really easy once you know what you want to implement. Designing the cross-language behaviors is incredibly hard, and we really underestimated how hard that would be. In some sense, it forces us to be language designers, and I didn't sign up for that, really. I, <laughs> I, I want to just compose two languages, so it, that's hard. Lots of items of future work, and there's just a, a few on this slide, in fact. We really need the ability to debug these programs. Although Python and PHP have um, debuggers in isolation, they can't debug pro compose programs. So you can use a PHP debugger on our, on our VM, but as soon as you call Python, the, the debugger knows nothing. Similarly for profiling. And of course, because we're no longer editing plain text, it means all of our plain text tools no longer work. So we can't use grep patch, um, git, etc. We currently have someone working on um, diffing AST, our composed ASTs. So watch this space with that. It would be interesting to throw in some statically typed and functional languages and see if we observe anything different. And I'd also like to try a composition with more than two languages. I imagine that there's lots of um, challenges in such a system. References, if this interests you, there's a few papers on all of this stuff. And I'm going to wrap up there, because I've been talking for almost an hour. That's good. Okay, thank you.